So today I'm going to talk about the basics of genome editing. Um, and I try to keep this talk as basic as possible. So there's a lot of ground to cover. So let's get started. Um, uh, first off, so what is genome editing? Um, and to answer this question, we need to think about what do we want to achieve when we perform genome editing? Uh, we want to either insert, uh, okay, that I'm not gonna use the pointer because it points completely wrong. <laughs> we either want to insert material into a, cell, into a cell's genome, or we want to replace DNA for, uh, elements or delete DNA elements. So while we can proficiently do this in a test tube using restriction enzymes and recombinant DNA technology, this is still fairly co complex task to achieve within a living cell. Um, and one way to do that actually is each time we are interacting with a cell's genome, the cell will respond to it using some of its host pathways, which are called DNA repair pathways. Uh, cells have two major DNA repair pathways. One, which is called non-homologous end joining, or NHEJ. And the second one, which is called HDR, or homology-directed repair. Upon introduction of a double strand break in any region of the genome, the cell will react to this by introducing DNA repair. Um, so usually when that happens, the cell wants to rapidly correct this break because free DNA ends can lead to genome instability. NHEJ, or non-homologous end joining, uses DNA binding enzymes to make small uh, re resections of the ends and literally just fuses them back together. This is why NHEJ is an error-prone DNA repair uh, pathway, which can lead to the formation of insertions and deletions uh, or briefly indels. And if an indel occurs in the coding sequence of a gene, what can happen very often is that we introduce so-called premature stop codons. So using NHEJ would actually potentially allow us to delete genes. On the other hand, cells can also use homology-directed repair. In homology-directed repair, upon introduction of a double strand break, the ends of the DNA are resected to a larger extent than in NHEJ, and the cell uses a repair template. Usually this repair template is a second allele or a second chromosome if present during the cell cycle. <clears throat> Ultimately, the cell will copy the genetic information from the repair template into the broken DNA strand. And this would allow us, in theory, to perform precise genome editing. However, if uh, if the cell uses the endogenous repair template, we will not have any insertion or change in the sequence. So people have found out that by providing exogenous templates that share homology with the region you're targeting, you can actually trick the cell into copying this information into its own genome. So how can we now basically use the, these ideas in a cell? As I told you, all of this starts with the introduction of a double strand break. So it sounds easy enough. Let's just introduce a double strand break at a specific region in the human genome. The problem to this, however, is that the human genome is pretty large with three times 10 to the ninth base pairs in a haploid human genome, which means that using tools that we usually use in lab, like restriction enzymes that have a recognition sequence of about six base pairs, those enzymes would cut on average in a random sequence every 4,096 base pairs, which means they would cut multiple times within the human genome, not allowing us to target one specific locus. We can now play this further and say, but what if we had a 10 base pair cutting enzyme? This would lead to a cut at every millionth base pair on average, still way more often than once in theory. If, on the other hand, we had a 20 base per hypothetical restriction enzyme, then we could achieve cleavage every 1.1 E12 or uh, base pairs on average, which would allow us to basically use a 20 base per cutter to define, statistically speaking, single defined uh, locations in the human genome. 
So how do we get 20 base pair or on the order of 20 base pair specific restriction enzymes? How can we engineer them? Where do they come from? And what do we need to consider? This is a very, very long road of people trying to figure out how to use naturally occurring systems for genome engineering in human cells. And it all started out with zinc finger nucleases. Zinc fingers were initially identified as uh, essential elements of eukaryotic transcription factors. And as you can see in this schematic, a single zinc finger forms contacts with three base pairs in DNA. So let's assume we have a vast library of zinc finger proteins or zinc finger domains that we can fuse together to program specific target sequences. As I told you, these zinc fingers usually occur in transcription factors. So intrinsically, zinc fingers have no endonuclease activity and would not cleave DNA, even if they were binding DNA. One way around would be to use something that nature has already invented. As I mentioned before, restriction enzymes have the capacity to cleave DNA. Um, and one restriction enzyme called FOC1 actually is composed of an N-terminal DNA binding domain and a C-terminal cleavage domain. So by fusing the cleavage domain of FOC1 onto um, an array of zinc fingers, we can actually localize the, zinc fin uh, the FOC1 domain at the specific region in the genome. However, FOC1 acts as a dimer. So basically, we need to have two FOC1 domains come together. As you can see in the crystal structure on the right, the zinc fingers are represented as in this barrel-like structure, forming contact with the DNA. And in this case, we are using two zinc finger nucleases where the two FOC1 domains come together, forming an active dimer, which can then introduce a double strand break in the region between uh, the sequences we targeted. So while this all sounds great, uh, it's actually very challenging to engineer these zinc finger arrays for specific regions. And the reason for this is, as I told you, every zinc finger domain uh, con makes contact with three nucleotides in DNA. That already means that we need a large, large library of engineered zinc finger domains to actually target a specific sequence. Moreover, zinc fingers are somewhat context dependent, meaning that if you fuse multiple zinc fingers in a row, their targeting specificity might change. Luckily, People found another system in nature. Yes. yes, there's a question online from an anonymous attendee uh, back when you were talking about HDR. And they ask, in HDR, is it sufficient to have not endogenous template? Do we want to ensure that it's functional in some way? Um, yeah. Is it sufficient to have non endogenous template? Yes. Um, yeah, it can be if it can be sufficient. So you can trick the cell, as I mentioned, uh, into using exogenous templates for uh, the repair process. But there is, I mean, it's, it's slightly unclear like how much endogen, uh, exogenous template you would need to get the template to be in the right place at the right time. And there is actually tricks that people have used to put these templates and localize them uh, at regions of double strand breaks. But yes, in theory, that's enough. Um, okay, so zinc fingers are great, but pretty hard to design. So what else is out there? Um, people actually discovered a family of proteins out of bacteria, which is called transcription activator-like effectors, or TAILs, that are naturally occurring type three secretion system effector proteins, and are basically transcription factors that bacteria use to manipulate host cell physiology. So here in the top part, you see the typical domain architecture of a tail, where you have nuclear localization signals and an activation domain, which allows the recruitment of the basal transcription machinery upon binding to its target sequence. <clears throat> in contrast to zinc fingers, tails actually turned out to be guided by so-called repeats. And each of these repeats forms contact with one single nucleotide, making it much more straightforward to engineer these proteins. 
Uh, each of these 34 amino acid repeats has a region called RVD, or repeat variable dinucleotide, uh, di residue, which basically specifies which nucleotide this domain would bin, uh, bind. Um, so one of the problems is with this system, even though it's fairly straightforward, we still need to engineer multiple repeats, ideally 20 repeats, in a row in the lab before we can use the system. Um, and similar to zinc finger nucleases, if you're fusing FOC1 domains onto these uh, tail effectors, you can form something that's called TALENS, uh, transcription activator like endonucleases, um, that allow you now to target specific regions in, the, in any genome and basically introduce double strand breaks. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, you can actually see the structure of a tail, which looks very pretty with uh, the major part of the repeat pointing outward, spiraling away from the DNA double helix, and only these small RVD regions forming contact with the base pairs. Uh, so it basically forms a helix around the DNA double helix. Um, these enzymes are very, were very promising back in the day, but as I told you, assembling 20 of these repeats in the lab is a time-consuming process. So people were still on the hunt for other systems that could be potentially easier to engineer. And that's around the time when CRISPR came along. CRISPR initially identified uh, as repeats in the bacterial genome, stands for clustered regular, uh, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, which are these repeat arrays that you can see here. And it turned out that CRISPR is actually a prokaryotic immune system that allows bacteria and, uh, and archaea to, def uh, to defend against phages. So invading phages would be attacked by the system. It was slightly unclear how this actually works, uh, until people figured out that many of these CRISPR loci actually contain endonuclease domains, or and <laughs> proteins containing endonuclease domains. So uh, roughly speaking, there is two classes of CRISPR systems. And for the remainder of the talk, we will mainly focus on class two type five CRISPR systems, uh, uh, class two type two CRISPR systems, which contain Cas9, uh, simply because in this system, Cas9, the endonuclease is uh, contained as a single protein, which is capable of targeting, uh, binding DNA, targeting DNA, and cleaving DNA. Um, but as you can see, CRISPR comes in many flavors, and this is actually fairly outdated. There is significantly more work that has been done in the CRISPR space. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we are just going to focus on a type 2 CRISPR system. <coughs> So the first CRISPR system that was described was CRISPR-Cas9 from uh, uh, S. pyogenes. And if we look at the, genom uh, at the genomic locus for SP-Cas9, uh, SP we can see that there is a large protein called Cas9, followed by three smaller proteins. And then we have a region that's here denoted as trace RNA. And then these gray squares, which are direct repeats, which actually gave rise to the name of this system, followed by these uh, little diamonds that are the spacer elements. Turns out each of these spacer elements targets and is homologous to a region of phages that usually attack these bacteria. And how the system works is it basically uses a tracer RNA, which you see here in yellow, which then forms a complex with this CRISPR RNA, which basically is this spacer sequence up here. And this dual RNA system is then loaded onto Cas9, which allows Cas9 to identify specific target sequences in DNA and introduce a double strand break. Um, so it's great. It uses only two short RNAs to target whatever sequence you want. However, it turns out we can even simplify the system further by fusing the tracer RNA uh, with the CRISPR RNA, giving rise to what we now call a single guide RNA. And 
The system is fairly versatile and flexible. One key consideration is that next to this region that we are targeting, there is a sequence element called a PAM, which stands for Protospace Adjacent Motive. Um, and this PAM is specific for different cast proteins, but uh, basically has to occur not in the CRISPR RNA, but in the target locus. And this is how bacteria avoid cleaving their own CRISPR arrays. Um, if you look at the domain architecture of S. pyogenes Cas9, we can see that, first of all, it's a huge protein of like 1,368 amino acids. And it has two major domains, one called the rec lobe and one called the nucleobe. And in the nucleobe, we have two domains, which are called RUFC and HNH, which are the endonuclease active domains. Uh, here in the crystal structure, you can actually see that the single guide RNA, so this is an engineered version of this guide RNA that's fused, uh, is loaded into the protein and forms kind of um, part of this protein complex. And then here in yellow, you can actually see the target strand that is being bound by uh, the guide RNA. <clears throat> so now, the system is great, but does it work in human cells? Um, to answer this question, a lot of people actually explored how do we have to engineer the system further to make it work in human cells? And it turns out it can be fairly simple by taking a promoter that allows us to express an RNA species called the single guide RNA again, uh, and a promoter that allows us to express a human codon optimized, uh, optimized variant of SPCAS9 fused to nuclear localization signals to get the protein to the nucleus of cells. Um, if you do this and you put this into hex cells, you can actually see that using different protospacers, and protospacers basically just means guides, targeting the EMX1 locus in mammalian cells, we can actually see that there is the introduction of uh, double strand breaks in this region and the, formation, and the coincident formation of indels. Um, moreover, we see that the CRISPR, in its initial conception, uh, the dual guided CRISPR tracer system was more efficient than the single guided system. However, a lot of work has been done, uh, and the system is very efficient now in mammalian cells. <clears throat> One problem with SPCAS9 that I mentioned is uh, it's very, very large. And a lot of viruses that we use for delivering uh, payloads in, in the lab, but also in the clinic, uh, are actually based on adeno-associated viruses, which have a fairly limited cargo capacity of 4.7 kilobases. So luckily, again, nature has an answer for us or a solution for this problem, which is Staph aureus Cas9. Staph aureus Cas9 is slightly smaller than uh, SP Cas9. And uh, using Staph aureus Cas9, again, fused to nuclear localization signals, and a U6 promoter driving a single guide RNA expression, we can actually package all of this into one AAV. Uh, so people have tried this and have actually validated that it works in cells in a dish, produced virus, targeting the PCSK9 gene in mice, injected this into mice, and analyzed what happened upon injection into mice. And as you can see here, there is a very high percentage with roughly 50% uh, of indel formation at the PCSK9 locus. A key reason to target PCSK9 is that it's a secreted protein. So we can basically just test serum and ask, what is happening? Do we actually see a reduction in PCSK9? And indeed, in the time before injection, we see that the PCSK9 levels are fairly stable. But shortly after injection of the targeting system, we can actually see a very strong decrease in PCSK9 production. <clears throat> there was a question online just yeah. asking when you refer to efficiency. Is it really cleaving? Is it talking about the efficiency of cleavage, the efficiency of the um, repair, or what do you? Uh, in which? 
Um, I think when you were talking about the efficiency of the various Cas9. Um, in, in that slide? Yeah. Um, so this efficiency here basically means uh, in Dell formation. Uh, yeah. At the, at the targeting site. Yes, so, yeah. exactly. So yeah, we, we haven't spoken a lot about off targets or anything like that. So <laughs> yeah, just at the targeting site. Just with one. Thanks so much. Um, OK, so now we know CRISPR systems can be engineered to work in mammalian cells. And furthermore, they can be engineered to work in a whole animal. Um, so one thing that's also interesting to think about is where did CRISPR systems actually come from? And to answer this question, uh, two of my colleagues, Somia and Han, actually looked into a protein called ISCB, which shares a lot of uh, domain similarities uh, with, SP Cas uh, with Cas9. And it turns out that ISCB usually is part of transposable elements, uh, which have two transposable ends, and is preceded by a conserved region. And turns out that this conserved region is actually an expressed RNA, which they called omega RNA, which is short for obligate mobile element guided activity RNA. Uh, and it's very similar to, SP, or to CRISPR systems, in which the omega RNA and ICB form a complex and this complex is capable of introducing double strand breaks. So in this example here, you see that if you use guide one on target one in the presence of a TAM, and TAM is pretty much the same as a protospacer adjacent motif, but in this case, it's a target adjacent motif, we can actually see efficient induction of double strand breaks uh, on double strand DNA. However, if you don't have a TAM present, you don't see this induction of double strand breaks. And similarly, if we don't have the target present. Um, if we now reprogram the system, we can actually see that with, guide, uh, with target two and the TAM in target two, we can also um, get in efficient induction of double strand breaks, which means that omega systems are indeed uh, programmable endonucleases. And this also allowed them to infer the uh, evolutionary history of Cas9, which is shown here on the right. And basically the idea is that ISCB, as part of transposable elements, started to associate with a CRISPR array. At that point, it became a kind of a hybrid CRISPR omega RNA system. And then ISCB underwent multiple domain insertions and the emergence of a tracer RNA, and all of these steps can actually be shown as systems that occur in nature. Um, so then you have the tracer RNA emerging, the CRISPR array. Um, it then happens that the CRISPR tracer RNA decouples from the mRNA because at that stage they are presumably still co-expressed from the same RNA. Um, and Cas9, due to the uh, domain insertions, takes over more of the role of what the tracer RNA or the omega RNA do in omega systems. Uh, so the tracer RNA can shorten. And then finally, Cas9 associates with Cas1, Cas2, and other proteins which are important for space acquisition uh, later on. So, so far I've only spoken about what we can do if we cleave DNA and introduce double strand breaks. But one of the nice features of Cas9 is that it actually has two very defined endonuclease domains, which are called, as I told you, the rough C domain and the HNH domain. The HNH domain cleaves the target strand. This is the strand where the guide RNA interacts with uh, the sequence in the genome, whereas the rough C domain cleaves the non-target strand. So what if we now introduce uh, point mutations into these domains, this would actually give rise to something that we, can, that we call a nickase. So if we specifically abolish cleavage activity in the HNH domain, we can get a nickase that specifically only cleaves the non-target strand. If we, mutate the HNA, uh, if we mutate the rough C domain, we can actually give rise to an enzyme that basically only cleaves the target strand. 
And if you mutate both of them, we have an enzyme that basically doesn't do anything anymore, yet it still binds to DNA. Um, so how can we use these concepts for genome editing? And one of the first ideas that came uh, was base editing. In base editing, what you're doing is you want to change a uh, nucleotide in the human genome for another one. For example, what if we wanted to convert a cytosine to a thymidine? Uh, turns out that actually by deaminating cytosine, you get uracil. And uracil is read by polymerases as thymidine. So in theory, that would be possible. Uh, Work out of David Lu's lab actually took this to the test and engineered a system which uses a Cas9 nickase fused to a uracil glycosylase inhibitor and a cytidine deaminase derived from rat apobac one um, They needed to add a uracil glycosylase inhibitor because otherwise uracil would basically be removed from the genome after being produced, uh, as this happens very frequently. Um, and it turns out that the system is actually capable of introducing the targeted conversion of cytidines into thymidines within a fairly large window of roughly 10 nucleotides uh, of the targeting sequence. So any cytosine within a window of 10 nucleotides would be converted into um, a uracil and ultimately via DNA repair uh, into a thymidine. So uh, that's a cool system. But then also, what if we want to change other bases? Uh, so again, the LULAB took it out upon them to figure out how can we actually build an adenine base editor. Uh, the idea of an adenine base editor would be the conversion of an adenine to a guanine. And turns out that if you take adenosine and you deaminate it, it turns into inosine, which can be read by polymerases as G. Uh, the idea was, again, fairly similar. You take a Cas9 nickase, you fuse it to a deoxyadenosine deaminase. The system would bind to your target region. It would nick the non-edited strand because the deaminase would deaminate uh, the adenosine, which would turn into an inosine. And then, upon introduction of DNA repair, or replication, you would actually install this uh, guanine in the base edited DNA. Um, however, there is not many adenine, uh, adenosine deaminases that are known to act on DNA. And the LULAB figured out that TAD-A from E. coli, um, which is a tRNA adenosine deaminase, can actually act on DNA. And usually, TAD-A acts as a dimer. So by fusing two TAD-A domains uh, in tandem onto a Cas9 nickase or a dead Cas9, you can actually introduce very specific uh, base editing in the targeting region. The last thing that, or one of the more, uh, most recent things that the LULAB did in terms of base editing is the technology called prime editing, in which you basically use a very different approach to achieve conversions, which is uh, changes of nucleotides for specific sequences. But the system is even capable of introducing uh, DNA, small DNA fragments, so of producing, generating small insertions. And how the system, in theory, was thought to work is if you use a prime editor and you fuse Cas9 to an RT, to a reverse transcriptase domain, um, and you provide a PEG RNA, which is a prime editing guide RNA, uh, which is basically a guide RNA with an extended three prime end. And within this extended three prime end, we now have an RNA in the vicinity of a, re of a reverse transcriptase and reverse transcriptases act on RNA and form DNA from RNA. So if, our, if the system works, it basically uh, results from binding of the guide RNA to the target locus. 
we would then introduce uh, a, a nick in the non-target strand. This would allow the extended peg RNA uh, to bind and hybridize with the region that we now uh, freed up. And now we can include edits in this region of the peg RNA that upon reverse transcription would be directly synthesized onto our target region. Now, there is two things that can happen. So we'll generate this overhang called flap, and this flap contains our edit. So if a cell repairs this flap, uh, we would lose our edit. But luckily, there is something called flap equilibration, where actually every so often, our edit would actually be um, our edit would actually be paired with the target, and you have five prime uh, you have a five prime end from the endogenous flap, which then can be cleaved. And if we cleave this flap away and we relight DNA, we actually get this hybrid DNA, which contains on the one hand our edit and on the other hand the wild type sequence. Now, going through DNA repair, it happens every so often that we actually get edited DNA. Um, the LULAB also developed like, more sophisticated uh, strategies to increase the probabilities of this lower uh, path to actually lead to edited DNA. And they ultimately were able to show that uh, you can achieve small insertions and deletions with fairly high efficiency and low indel formation in, at multiple loci in mammalian cells. Um, another thing that you can do with nuclease dead Cas9s is we can now use those Cas9s as transcription factors. And the idea being, if we take a dead Cas9 and we fuse it to a transactivation domain, in this, in this case called VP64, uh, that would already serve as a transcription factor. But to increase the uh, transcription output, we can also insert MS2 loops into the guide RNA. So we engineer the guide RNA to co contain MS2 loops. And MS2 loops are bound by MBP or MS2 binding protein, which we can then fuse to even more transactivating domains, for example, P65 and HSF1. Upon engaging with a target, uh, this guide RNA would then recruit, together with uh, the Cas9 BP64 fusion, would recruit multiple copies of these transactivators. And this whole complex is called synergistic activation mediator complex, or SAM complex, which allows you to target uh, Cas9 and uh, basic trans uh, basal transcription machinery to genes. So one thing that you need to do is you need to target the upstream region, uh, so the promoter region of a gene. Uh, and then you can evaluate whether you actually see activation of the target gene. And in this upper panel, you can see the fold activation of target genes uh, in N2A cells upon introduction of the system with single, single guide RNAs. Uh, so guide RNAs targeting one single locus at a time. But What's also very nice about the system is it's highly multiplexable. So by basically putting all these guide RNAs together into the same cell, we can actually get activation of all these genes in the same cell. I will use the last couple of minutes to talk about um, the first approved CRISPR therapeutic and how we got there. Um, so the UK just basically approved uh, the first CRISPR therapeutic for uh, sickle cell and beta thalassemia. And uh, the therapeutic is called Casgevi or Exocell, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the long word there. But uh, it's based on a lot of basic biology findings that allowed us to actually do this. So let's first start out with what is sickle cell. Uh, sickle cell disease is a disease that's caused by a point mutation in the HBB gene. Uh, which is the beta subunit of human hemoglobin. And this point mutation usually is called HBBS, gives rise to a beta subunit that upon low oxygen would form these fibers. 
And the formation of these fibers gives actually rise to the sickle cell shape that you can observe in patient uh, blood. So we now know it's a point mutation, but there is an interesting feature of hemoglobin during development where embryonic hemoglobin is usually composed of two, uh, okay, almost there, uh, of two chains, a zeta chain and an epsilon chain. Uh, and over time during the de uh, embryonic development, uh, the composition actually switches to fetal hemoglobin, which is composed of two alpha chains and two gamma chains. And then right around birth, uh, this composition changes again from, uh, from two alpha chains, uh, from two gamma chains to two beta chains. So the idea being that we could try to figure out how this switch actually happens. And um, genome-wide association studies actually showed that there is a locus that is enriched in people with high uh, fetal hemoglobin expression, uh, which maps to BCL11A. So what is BCL11A? Uh, BCL11A is a master regulator of globin expression. And it has been shown early on that if we look at the beta globin locus in humans and we perform CHIPC experiments or CHIP QPCR experiments for BCL11A, we can actually see that it binds specifically to multiple regions in the beta globin locus. And it wasn't until recently that this mechanism was fully elucidated uh, where BCL11A is uh, binding upstream of the beta globin locus to cause silencing of this region and causes domain looping allowing the expression of beta globin. So what happens at, uh, at around birth is that BCL11A starts to get expressed. It will start to repress gamma globin and will give rise to expression of beta globin. Uh, at the fetal stage, however, BCL11A is absent and so we get expression of gamma globin. So one idea that we could have to address uh, hemoglobinopathies and sickle cell disease is what if we reactivate the GABA globin gene? And to do that, using CRISPR, we can actually now try to figure out which guide RNAs would allow us to specifically repress BCL11A in erythrocytes. So we don't necessarily want to destroy BCL11A in hematopoietic stem cells, but we could uh, try to figure out where BCL11A needs to bind, uh, what, what, uh, yeah, what region of the BCL11A enhancer is important for BCL11A expression in red blood cells. So to do this, you can clone an array of guide RNAs for the region of interest, uh, put that into cells, and then sort cells by their expression level of uh, fetal hemoglobin. And then finally, you can map these guide RNAs back onto the genome. So if you do a screen like this, you find a guide RNA called SG1621, which specifically downregulates BCL11A expression. It also results in higher gamma globin expression and finally, it also results in higher fetal hemoglobin in cells. And this single guide 1621 that was described by Kamba et al. in 2015 is now the active ingredient and the active guide RNA in uh, Kasgevi. So this is just a short overview of what I've talked about today and a rough timeline of all these events. Um, and with this, I just want to thank the Zhang Lab for being an amazing place to do science. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take your questions.